I think we're we've got a nice excited group here today. And so so this is the uh, the twelfth class uh, out of our twenty. Uh, this is the fourth and final discussion of the Karen Silkwood case. Uh, as you know, we had, we had divided it into these four parts. The first one, which Sarah told you about the organizing and public education and the, the efforts to get a FBI investigation and to get the Oklahoma State Law Enforcement Authorities to do their job, which they didn't do. Then the congressional hearings. Then the second lecture was on the investigation uh, and the discovery process that we went through. Uh, the the uh, third installment was the trial itself. And uh, today, the fourth section and final section is to talk about the appellate process uh, of the Silkwood case. A very confusing set of uh, arguments that went on at different levels at the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals and, uh, and all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Now, I, I want to I reemphasize this: this is not a law school class, so uh, I will not be uh, doing the thing that I would normally do when I was teaching law school. Uh, asking you guys to uh, tell me the answer to a, a bunch of questions that uh, would probably terrify you. Yes. Oh, I have uh, a more of a general question. Yeah. So do you give student pre-student legal advice? <laughs> <laughs> yes. As, as long as you've done something adequately serious. <laughs> I want punky, punky stuff, you know. Like, how do I sue your roommate or something? It's kind of something like you're up against the state. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, just give me, give me a call. Okay. So as I was saying, this is, this is not a law school class, so I won't be asking you to answer some of these key questions. If, if, I, if it were a law school class, I would be asking you, for example, to you know, who can tell me, for example, out of the class, uh, how many separate written opinions were there uh, in the course of this particular case? And uh, who is it that wrote them? Uh, and what were their respective positions taken? But I won't ask you that. I, I see horror uh, in your eyes. Uh, and and I, I would also ask you in a regular law school class, how many distinct legal issues uh, were raised on appeal that were addressed in, in the course of this case. And then I would ask you, of course, what were the positions that were taken on each of these uh, various uh, legal uh, issues by the Silkwood <coughs> plaintiffs, by the Kerr McGee defendants, uh, by Judge Tice in his original uh, trial court uh, decision based upon the findings of the jury, uh, and in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, both with regard to the federal civil rights uh, count that was dismissed by Judge Tice and with regard to the contamination count, uh, both with regard to uh, Judge, Judge Logan and Judge McKay, their two-person opinion of the Tenth Circuit, and then uh, Justice Doyle's dissent. And then I would, of course, ask you to tell me about the Supreme Court opinions and who wrote them and what their positions were. But since I haven't uh, asked you to have to uh, do that kind of uh, detailed work uh, in this course. Uh, I won't, I won't uh, try to terrify you any longer by asking those questions, uh, but I'll tell you what the answer to, to those are uh, by way of kind of elucidating the complexity of a case like this. For those of you who are contemplating going to law school, I, I want to just show you that, there, that, that it isn't all kind of theatrics and and uh, kind of like television trials and stuff that go on. There, there is a part of every major important case that goes up into the appellate process, and then it becomes extremely uh, rigorous uh, intellectually and uh, and legally. And uh, but the the key is that you cannot lose your way in the midst of all of those complexities from kind of following certain kind of simple lines of analysis uh, because these. Uh, these lines of analysis, for the most part, track particular worldviews uh, that I've talked about in the past. And so that if you can keep your eye on what the specific issues are, you can predict pretty well what particular judges are going to do about them, uh, given their worldview, which you can discern from their previous opinions. 
Uh, but in this particular case, there turns out that there were actually eight, eight different written opinions uh, in the course of, of this litigation. There was the original uh, opinion uh, written by Judge Tice, of course, uh, and then there were uh, there was the uh, opinion of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals on the issue of uh, Judge Tice's dismissal of the federal civil rights claim, count one. Then there was, with regard to the contamination uh, appeal, there was the two-judge two opinion uh, written by Judge, judge Logan, and there was the dissent that was written by Judge Doyle. Uh, and then there was the uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, the one that was written by Justice White. Uh, and then there were dissents that were written by Justice Blackman and then by Justice Powell. And then there was a full-scale written opinion by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals again when the case was remanded back down to them after their first set of decisions had been reversed by the Supreme Court. Uh, so that, that it's, it's a complex web of opinions and, uh, and issues that we're dealt with. And it turns out there were six specific issues of law that were raised uh, during the course of the, of the appellate process in this. So I will talk with you about those so that you'll be able to get a sense both of the complexity and yet, if I'm successful, the kind of, the kind of simplicity uh, and clarity of these types of particular issues that you have to be able to uh, track if you're going to be uh, lawyers. Okay, now the, the, first, the first major issue, of course, uh, was the issue of the dismissal of the federal civil rights uh, count that was in the case. The, uh, the, uh, the Kerr-McGee Corporation took the simple position uh, that the, uh, all of these accusations that were being made about what was done to Karen Silkwood and the wiretapping of her and the other union officials, the, the surveillance against them and all of those things, uh, the Kerr-McGee Corporation took the position that the National Labor Relations Act uh, was exclusive that there was a piece of federal legislation that had gotten passed uh, at the behest of the, uh, of the unions and the, uh, the corporations that basically occupied the whole field here. And uh, therefore, if the accusation that was being made is that Karen Sokol was wiretapped, uh, had her home bugged, was contaminated, uh, was assaulted, was uh, killed and run off the highway, uh, that the National Labor Relations Act would cover all of this because it was in the context of a labor dispute that those uh, actions were undertaken against her. And that the corporations had uh, paid all that money to get the National Labor Relations Act passed to limit their liability and to establish a, an administrative agency, the National Labor Relations uh, Board, to, uh, to determine what kind of wrongdoing might have been done by the corporation and what type of fines might be uh, imposed against them. So that, that was one of the, the, the major issues in this. But uh, there was also the issue, of course, you remember, that uh, the Judge Tice uh, actually ruled sort of sui sponte uh, when the Central Intelligence Agency came to see him and to uh, tell him that, that this case, after I had revealed to Judge Tice in affidavits that this drug, this, excuse me, this plutonium smuggling was going on uh, from this plant, and there was a major scandal that underlay the killing of Karen Silkwood. Uh, Judge Tice came back and told me that that was just a glass mountain, that we were not going to be allowed to climb in this case, and he actually dismissed the account based upon what was a very iffy uh, proposition, and that is that the Federal Civil Rights Act protected only black people since it was passed right after the Civil War was won, and therefore since Karen Silkwood didn't claim that she was a member of the Negro race, she could not recover. Uh, so the, uh, so that, there's that whole set of issues that relate to the uh, dismissal of the federal civil rights complaint. Uh, then there was the, the question of whether or not, and the Kermagee maintained that, uh, and this is rather an extraordinary thing, you saw how irked, well, I guess you didn't, you didn't read actually just Judge Tice's opinion, but you can see how irked he was by the position that Kermagee took. 
Kerr-McGee took the position that so long as Kerr-McGee substantially complied with the rules and regulations governing the safe operations of a plant that had been enacted by the Atomic Energy Commission in its rules and regulations, uh, and as long as the inspectors that came and inspected their plant from the Atomic Energy Commission, you know, did not in fact find them to be guilty of any major violations of the act, uh, they were completely immunized against any type of civil liability, no matter what damage was actually caused by the operation of their plant. Uh, that, that includes whether they had damaged the people that were working there, whether they damaged the people in the environment, uh, whether it was an escape of plutonium from their plant that damaged people. As long as whatever those actual damages were that were suffered uh, were not suffered as a consequence of their breaching substantially some specific rule or regulation of the Atomic Energy Commission, that they should be immunized completely against any liability whether it's, for, uh, whether it's for compensatory damages for injury to people, uh, to their person or their property, or in, for certain, any punitive damages, that they should not be allowed to be uh, held liable for that if they had substantially complied uh, with the AEC rules and regulations, no matter how insufficient those particular rules and regulations were. And thirdly, they argued, that the personal damages that were suffered by Karen Silkwood, her physical injuries, uh, had to be covered by the Workmen's Compensation Act. Uh, that uh, it was their position, uh, of course the Kerr McGee position, is that she had taken this out of the plant on purpose and contaminated herself with it. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, therefore they shouldn't be liable at all because this was an intentional act on her part but they had a fallback position, and that is, is that it would have been covered by workman's compensation, which means, you know, like if in workman's compensation, if you're not familiar with it, is, you know, if you're working at a plant and uh, it takes off one of your arms and one of your legs, it's like about $50 for an arm and about $100 for a leg, you know, that the, that the corporations have been very successful in lobbying to get the uh, particular limitations on the amount you'll be able to receive. But, of course, they argue that, but it's a certain reward that you don't have to go through the trouble of litigation to actually get that kind of recovery. You'll get the whole 50 bucks for your arm and the whole $100 for your leg. Uh, but of course the corporations then escape the possibility of having to go to trial and have you get a million dollars, which is a pretty good bargain for the corporations. And so the Kermit E. Corporation argued that whatever physical injuries were suffered by Karen Silkwood had to be covered by the Workman's Compensation Act which means that she would get several hundred dollars, perhaps. And then fourthly, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the issue arose as to whether or not the doctrine of strict liability would apply to the $5,000 worth of damage to her home. Uh, there's a very specific question here about, there, there's a doctrine of strict liability which says that whether or not they were negligent or not, whether or not they complied with all the rules and regulations of the AEC, should this special doctrine of law apply, which is strict liability. The, the image is always used, if you want to take, keep a pet lion in your house, and the lion gets away and eats your neighbor, they don't want to hear you arguing about what great lengths you went to to keep the lion from getting out of your house. Because you were engaged in what they call an especially dangerous undertaking. It's an inherently dangerous undertaking, and if the consequences result from that which might be anticipated, due to its danger, you have to pay. And so that, that issue was up on appeal. And then the question arose, of course, is whether or not uh, the negligence, uh, the simple negligence standard could be applied uh, to the activities of Kerr McGee, and did the evidence that was adduced by the plaintiffs during the course of the trial uh, support a jury verdict which found Kerr McGee to be negligent and to be the proximate cause of the damage to Karen Silkworth. And then uh, sixthly and finally, the one that made the case majorly famous was the issue of whether or not the imposition of punitive damages by the jury, the $10 million judgment, making this the largest judgment in the entire history of the United States up to that point, uh, whether that, uh, that punitive damage award 
uh, somehow uh, was the equivalent of the state attempting to regulate the nuclear industry after there'd already been a previous decision uh, in the Northern uh, States Power case the year before by the Supreme Court that a state could not pass a set of regulations attempting to more rigorously uh, regulate the nuclear industry than had been enacted by Congress. Okay? And so the, the, the question arose is whether or not Silkwood and all of their crafty lawyers had somehow managed to get around this previous ruling uh, that in fact the, the, uh, the Price-Anderson Act and the whole scheme of the atomic energy uh, system was the sole and exclusive regulatory means for the private nuclear industry. Now, so those, those, are, the, those are the six uh, major uh, issues that were raised on appeal. And uh, I just want to briefly cover with you, that just so that even though this is not training you to be lawyers, that you'll know some things about these major concepts that make the Karen Sokol case so important. Taking them in, in the order that we identified them, the, the federal civil rights count, there were three actual uh, elements, uh, four actual elements actually, in whether or not a recovery could be made under the Federal Civil Rights Act. The first issue was whether or not the specific actions that were charged against Kerr McGee, the wiretapping, uh, the electronic surveillance and bugging of her home, the, uh, the attack upon her to stop her from exercising her right to free speech, uh, the uh, right, the, the acts taken against her to stop her from exercising her right to freedom of the press, that is getting to the New York Times reporter to talk to him, uh, and the, her right to travel on the highway, her fundamental human right to free travel. Uh, whether the violation of any of these rights constituted uh, one of the rights, privileges, or immunities of citizens of the United States. Uh, that were protected under the Federal Civil Rights Act, because uh, many people many people claim that the the rights that are, were were enumerated in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, uh, applied only to the federal government. That the federal the United States Constitution was a document that created the existence of the United States government that did not exist naturally by any means, and that it was a construct of the Constitution and that the, the specific provisions of the Bill of Rights were specific powers that were withheld from that newly created government by the people, okay? And so the, there was no power given to the, to the federal government that was created by the Constitution to pass any law restricting the freedom of speech, for example, or any right to pass, the power to pass any kind of statute that interfered with the right of freedom of religion. They simply didn't have that kind of authority. Okay, in light of the, the Constitution. The question that arose was, is that what was the effect of the 14th Amendment? At the end of the Civil War, when the Civil, when the, the Civil Rights Act was passed, and it prohibited the states from engaging in any type of violation of the rights, privileges, or immunities of citizens of the United States, that, uh, that did, the, did the 14th Amendment do that, or did the 14th Amendment only guaranteed to members of the black race the equal protection of those rights, whatever those rights were, over and against the states. And the states claim that, that uh, even if that were true, that the rights that were enforceable against the states did not include those rights that were articulated in the Bill of Rights, because the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government. That's a very profound and important issue that you'll learn an awful lot about in law school when you go there. Uh, that there, there was a, a very clear position taken by most of the constitutional scholars at the beginning that clearly all of those fundamental rights that were identified as belonging to citizens of the United States, which the federal government had no authority to transgress, were natural law rights. And that naturally they would obtain over and against the federal government and over and against the state government as well. And it was, it was a perfectly natural uh, consequence of the theory of natural law. But those who in fact believed that the, the statutes were the source of rights would believe that the states had the right to engage in any activity that it wanted to and that these rights didn't exist unless the state gave them those rights. 
okay? And there was no place where the states gave them those rights that were similar to the Bill of Rights. So, so this big argument went on here. That they, they argued that, uh, the Kermagee people argued, that uh, the activities that were engaged in could not be uh, stopped uh, by this purely private group of people, the private conspiracy group, uh, the, uh, the security people from the Kermagee Corporation. We argued, of course, that, well, clearly there was state activity involved in this conspiracy because there were members of the Oklahoma City Police Department, Harold Barron's, in Larry Upchurch, and, uh, and uh, David McBride, and Bill Byler. We argued that these were people that were full-time employees of the Oklahoma City Police Department. And that was the only reason they had access to the wiretapping equipment. But they argued in rejoinder to that, while well, they were doing this on their own time. Just they were acting in their own private capacity to do that. Okay? And then we argued in rejoinder that, in fact, well, the, the FBI was actively involved in covering up all of this wiretapping that Jackie Saruji had actually gotten the copies of the wiretap tech transcripts from Larry Olson, the FBI guy. So he knew perfectly well that she was being wiretapped, and he was participating in concealing that activity, that unlawful activity. So we argued that whether or not you consider this a purely private conspiracy, or whether you consider it a state conspiracy or a federal conspiracy, that we had a right to recover under the Federal Civil Rights Act. Uh, and we, we argued also that the National Labor Relations Act certainly did not, uh, did not surmount your right to recover under the Federal Civil Rights Act, that there was no intention on the part of the National Labor Relations Act to supplant the Federal Civil Rights Act. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we uh, and then there's one major key issue that you're going to have to remember, not because we're going to test you on it, but because you're going to have to know that if you go to law school, and that is the opponents of the Federal Civil Rights Act after it was passed in 1871, uh, they, they took the position that uh, even though the Federal Civil Rights Act says that any uh, group of people who participate in violating the rights of any person or any class of people violate, that conspire to violate the rights, privileges, and immunities of citizens of the United States, they shall be civilly liable under this federal statute. What they had done is they fought back uh, very early, and they said that no, uh, since the Federal Civil Rights Act was passed after the Civil War, there's only a, a class of people. Even if you don't confine the protections of the Civil Rights Act to just the black race, it has to be an entire class of people that were being targeted. In other words, what they asserted is that you have to prove that the particular plaintiff that you represent was attacked not because they disliked the person, but because that person was a member of a class, and that the conspirators had a class-based, invidious, discriminatory animus toward that entire class of people. And by 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 invidious, they mean that it, that it had to it had to be motivated by malice and not rational reasons. They had to have kind of this irrational uh, hostility toward an entire class of people. And that's why they attacked or, or violated and took away the rights, privileges, and immunities of the particular plaintiff you had. Now this is, these, these are the kinds of issues that were involved here. And when, when this case went up to the uh, Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, agreed that the rights, privileges, and immunities of citizens of the United States uh, included uh, more than just your right not to be discriminated against racially. They agreed that, that in fact, the, the, you got a right not to be wiretapped. Your Fourth Amendment uh, rights gave you a right not to be wiretapped. They gave you a right not to have your home bug. They agreed that the, free, the freedom of speech gave you a right to help organize a union. They agreed that freedom of the press gave you the right to have access to the New York Times. They agreed completely uh, when the appeal finally got to them that these rights, privileges, and immunities belonged to Karen Silkwood as a citizen of the United States. They also ruled that the National Labor Relations Act did not, in fact, occupy the field. Just because these activities were undertaken against people because they were in a labor union did not, in fact, mean that the National Labor Relations Act provided the sole and exclusive remedy to remedy attacks against them or specifically the violation of these rights on their part. Uh, however, 
they got to this issue of the class-based invidious discriminatory animus, and they, they took the position that it was quite clear to them that the, uh, the activities that were undertaken against Karen Silkwood by the, uh, allegedly by this conspiracy, uh, were undertaken against her because of her activities. Uh, not just because of her First Amendment activities, but because of her activities of, you know, going in and taking the, fi the, the documents out of her, their files and, uh, and doing all of those kind of things. And so they said that there was no class that had been actually targeted by this, and it was just Karen Silkwood. And that therefore it failed on the third uh, element that had to be proven, that it was a class-based invidious discriminatory animus that had motivated them in depriving her of these rights. Uh, and so they took the position that uh, she had uh, no rights. And they said that her, the class, was identified by activity not by some immutable physical characteristics such as race, gender, uh, or other uh, immutable physical characteristic. Now, we could beat them on that if we had taken that appeal to the United States Supreme Court because the, the fact is that we had the legislative history of the Federal Civil Rights Act which said, in fact, that if, in fact, a person were discriminated against just because they were a Democrat, uh, uh, then then you could in fact recover. Now clearly, being a Democrat uh, is based upon your activities. Uh, that you, you become a member of this, this isn't, a, this isn't some sort of uh, immutable physical characteristic. There are actually people who, who change from being Democrats to being, well, not Republicans, but they, they actually change from being Democrats to being independents, is a rule. But the, fa the fact of the matter is, is that it's not an immutable physical characteristic. And so the legislative history makes it clear that people who are members of a group that are defined by their common activities together, if those activities are First Amendment activities, that they're to be protected. Now that's a little more uh, detail than you need on that, but it's an important one because when you go to law school, this issue is going to come up. In the Karen Silkwood case, in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling in that case, which was not appealed to the Supreme Court, is going to be very important uh, for you to remember when, when you are asked anything about the Silkwood case itself. The second major issue was this, this argument that Kerr McGee made uh, over and above its argument that the National Labor Relations Act protected them against any violations of the Federal Civil Rights Act. They came back with this additional argument that the Atomic Energy Act and the, the Price-Anderson Act gave them complete immunity if they were just in substantial compliance with the rules and regulations promulgated by the Atomic Energy Commission. Now you remember the discussion we had the other, the other night about this is that, that it was clear the Atomic Energy Act and, and the, the AEC passed regulations that said you could be exposed to 40 nanograms of radioactive uh, plutonium contamination to your body and that it wouldn't violate any, any AEC regulation. And you could be exposed to 16 nanograms of, of radioactive exposure to your lungs and it still did not violate any AEC regulation. Even though experts would come in and say that that would give you cancer. Again, because the AEC regulation said the only thing that was in violation is if you had exposures that would result in immediate uh, adverse health effects, such as your teeth falling right out or your hair falling out. And that therefore the fact that you would develop cancer 10 years later was not in fact subject to their regulations. And so what Kerr McGee was arguing is that look, if the Atomic Energy Commission has deigned not to make that a rule or regulation that you had to abide by because it wanted to promote private nuclear power, then that was a decision that the Congress had made and therefore the court didn't have any right to allow anyone to recover damages for, for actual damages that were inflicted while they were still abiding by the rules and regulations. Now this, uh, this is one that, the, uh, that the, uh, the Court of Appeals did not accept. They said that with regard to any physical injury uh, that was not covered by workman's compensation. So that if you were an individual citizen that lived up next to a plant and you got contaminated, they said they thought that in fact uh, even if you'd been in full compliance with the rules and regulations, if actual damage occurred, 
then you could be held liable through the doctrine of strict liability. They did say that. Now, of course, as you remember, they said the Karen Silkwood's particular injury was covered by workman's compensation. They said, oh, it must have been uh, related to the plane. In fact, they went on in great detail going into the stuff about this kit that she had taken because the lot number 29 solid pieces of plutonium were in her urine sample. And they said that has to be really logically, it's the most logical reason uh, to conclude as to how her house got contaminated. And that it must have been, therefore, since she was ordered to take those, those urine samples as part of her job, it would be considered job related. And then they went on and on about how magnanimous they had to be about the Workman's Compensation Act. They had to apply it very liberally because the whole purpose was to get poor working people covered by workman's compensation. And so even though there's no authority whatsoever for the corporation to assert workman's compensation limitations, if no claim has been made by the worker, that the Court of Appeals allowed that to be done. They allowed the corporation to assert the, the workman's compensation and to stop the recovery. Okay, and so the, the, the Court of Appeals uh, denied the $500,000 recovery that had been awarded by the jury and supported by, by uh, Judge Tice. So that, 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 that's where $500,000 of the, the original uh, $10,505,000, that's where $500,000 was taken away by the Court of Appeals right away. And then the Court of Appeals turned themselves to this question of the of the uh, punitive damages, uh, it was a this is the this is the one that the case is most noted for. Uh, what they argued was that look, the, the Atomic Energy Commission has set up a thorough scheme of uh, promoting the development of private nuclear power. They have set standards. They have set limitations on the amount of damages that can be recovered. And and I'll explain a little bit of this to you. What they did in the Price Anderson Act in 1954. Congress passed the statute saying, look, uh, we want you private corporations, mainly uh, energy companies, mainly petroleum corporations, to, uh, to get into this field of developing private nuclear power. And for that reason, we're going to limit your liability. You are required to, if you want to come into this business, you are required to purchase $60 million worth of private insurance. And we, the government, will supplement and reimburse you for any amount of damages that you are held liable for over $60 million, which your insurance would cover, for anything above that all the way up to $560 million. The federal government will, will uh, reimburse you, reimburse you up to $500 million for any liability uh, for any particular release of plutonium or, or radiation into the community. Yes. Well, when a nuclear power plant melts down, I'm pretty sure a little more than uh, half a billion dollars damages. That's right. Or, and the, and so so that that question was raised. That question was raised as to whether or not it was unconstitutional for the Congress of the United States to deprive American citizens of the right to recover. Uh, the full amount of their damages at common law. And it, it hadn't been litigated yet, uh, by the time, by, but by the time we got to the Silkwood case, we were going to raise the constitutional claim. We were going to say that, uh, of course, they were going to argue it was moot because we'd only asked for $11 million. And so that they were going to argue that unless we raised our claim to be more than $560 million, it was moot to us. And so therefore, we couldn't make the claim. But the fact is that uh, it was claimed uh, by a, a environmental group, they raised the claim in North Carolina in a case called the uh, the Pacific Gas and Electric Corporation. Uh, they filed a lawsuit against uh, Duke Power uh, in the Pacific Gas and Electric. They filed a, a claim arguing that it was a violation of the rights of common law recovery and a right to a Sixth Amendment jury trial uh, to be denied uh, damages over and above $560 million. And the United States Supreme Court uh, had, in 1978, entered a ruling, uh, unanimously ruling, 
that the, uh, that the uh, deprivation of those rights under the equal, equal, rights, of, equal rights provisions, that by denying uh, victims of a nuclear contamination the same common law tort rights that others have is not, in fact, an arbitrary and capricious discrimination against nuclear victims because of the, the overriding, compelling government interest that the United States Congress and our government had in privately promoting private nuclear power. So that, 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 that was what we had to cope with in the Silkwood case. That United States Supreme Court case had come down in, so, in 1978. So what we did is we recrafted our position to say that we could get punitive damages. We could get punitive damages and that the jury would have a right to impose punitive damages to whatever level they wanted to, and that they couldn't be deprived of that particular tort claim. Okay, and so that's what Kerr McGee was catatonic about, or catalytic, actually. And they were jumping up and down and saying, "Look, you can't do this. You can't allow punitive damages to be imposed like you've done in this particular case with a five hundred thousand dollar damage to her person." and $5,000 damage to her home, you've allowed the jury to impose a $10 million a punitive on that. And so that if, if you allow that case to stand, then if a larger contamination takes place in a community, uh, and it goes up over the $560 million, they will have done an end run on the Pacific Gas and Electric case. And so uh, that's what we were doing, in fact. We were, we were attempting to figure out how to get around this particular decision that had been made the year before. And so we did. And so this, this case goes uh, all the way up to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. The 10th Circuit Court of Appeals said, well, look at, uh, obviously, uh, we can't allow punitive damages in this case. And it went up to the United States Supreme Court. And uh, this is where the, uh, the Donnybrook took place, up in the Supreme Court. And, uh, and so we, we got this, this really rather extraordinary decision. Now, when we went up there, the, we, we had this issue in front of us. Uh, we said, look it, we've got, we want to appeal the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmation of the dismissal of the federal civil rights count on the grounds that, uh, that the class couldn't be identified by activity, it had to be defined by uh, immutable physical characteristics. We want to appeal the uh, denial of the application of the Workman's Compensation Act that uh, denied the $500,000 physical injury. And of course, we want to appeal the uh, Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals argument that you couldn't get punitive damages. And so what happened is we, we uh, talked with a number of people that were major Supreme Court uh, uh, advocates at that time. And <clears throat> what, the, what the challenge was is they said, look, this is going to be a very very tight case uh, when you get up there. You guys are basically attempting to do an end run around the attempt of the private nuclear industry to cap the liabil their liability. And uh, the, the court is going to see that right away. And unless you direct all of their attention to that issue and figure out every single one of the judges that you're going to get on your side, and, and be lucky to win this by a five to four opinion, and thereby close down all construction of all nuclear power plants in the country. Uh, or you can raise these other points you want to raise. You can raise the issue of the Federal Civil Rights Act. You can try to carve that, that into that, that ruling and make sure that people, groups and organizations, classes that are identified by their activity as well as by immutable physical characteristics such as race or gender or ethnic origin. You can do that if you want, but if you do that, what's going to happen is any judge who disagrees with you on that point is going to be alienated. And they may, in fact, tend to then loosen up and, and go along with the argument that you aren't going to get punitive damages in exchange for giving you this other thing. And he said the same thing is true uh, with, with regard to the workman's compensation. You, know, you can go through this argument about who's got the burden of proof on the workman's compensation. Does the corporation have the right to invoke workman's compensation even if a claim has not been filed? You know, uh, but you can do that too. 
And you may be able to get, you know, a majority of people to agree with you on that. But if you do, in the process, you may well alienate at least one of the judges who may otherwise be willing to go along with your right to punitive damages. And so what do you want to do here? And so we had a long set of discussions about this whole thing. And you can imagine how, how intensely I felt about the federal civil rights claim, which had to do with the murder, which had to do with the, the, the running her off the highway, the bugging of her home, and, of course, the smuggling of plutonium which I definitely wanted to get into the record. Uh, and, and of course, you can also imagine the, how badly we wanted to get uh, the workman's compensation claim set aside, because the, it was perfectly evident that they, had, they, they contaminated her on purpose, and they contaminated her at her home, and it wasn't something that one could realistically expect to encounter in the workplace. Uh, but uh, uh, Michael Gottesman, who was working with us on this case, said, look, uh, let me just tell you, I'm just telling you, he said that I believe that this is going to be probably a five to four opinion, one way or the other, on your claim for punitive damages. And if, if you want to, if one of your major objectives is to stop the construction of all new private nuclear power plants in the country, you should, in my opinion, raise just that one issue and devote the entire briefing and the entire oral argument, because you only get a limited amount of time in front of the Supreme Court, basically 15 minutes. And so that if you want to, if you want to spread it around among all three of those arguments uh, and not answer all the questions that the judges might have about the punitive damages claim, you go ahead and do it. <clears throat> and so we finally resolved in discussions with the, uh, the Karen Sokol's parents and stuff. Uh, we ended up deciding, okay, look, at, we were going to put all of our eggs into this one basket. You know, we were going to go after the $10 million of punitive damages. And so we did. And we went to the United States Supreme Court on that issue. Uh, and as you could see from reading, reading the opinion, uh, we ended up, we ended up uh, getting uh, 16 states to join with us uh, and file amicus briefs with the United States Supreme Court advocating the allowing of punitive damages against private nuclear facilities. Uh, and uh, the only, the only uh, two entities supporting the uh, Kerr-McGee Corporation were the Reagan-Bush administration's Solicitor General on behalf of the United States government and the Atomic Industrial Forum, uh, the big lobby group for the private nuclear industry. And we had 16 states on our, on our side, and we went up in front of them and we won this case uh, by five to four. And uh, uh, from, from that date uh, forward, up until this past February, there had not been a single private nuclear facility either ordered or built in the United States as a result of the Karen Sokwood case. Now a lot of people, totally myopically, uh, think that the reason there haven't been any nuclear power plants built was because of Three Mile Island. But I pointed out to you, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Because if we hadn't done this case, if we hadn't done the Silkwood case, and we hadn't basically uh, won the right to establish punitive damages against a private nuclear facility, then there, it wouldn't have interfered with the insurability. That's what interfered with the insurability. They couldn't get any more uh, insurance because they knew perfectly well that the, the industry, the, the insurance industry, was not willing to give any single, any single plant more than $60 million of liability. And they knew perfectly well that there was an escape of plutonium from the facility that contaminated it, such as Japan, which they, which they anticipate costing you know, at least $650 billion to try to just, to try just get those, those reactors cleaned up uh, and, to, and to decontaminate just the area within the immediate area there. So that uh, we, up, we, we won this particular decision five to four, and it is extraordinarily uh, close uh, in this thing because, because uh, we, we actually, it, it wasn't so hard to get uh, 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 Stevens and, uh, and O'Connor in, in Wizard White, even though all three of those judges had immediately the year before ruled that it was not unconstitutional 
for the, the uh, Price-Anderson Act to set a limitation on the, uh, on the amount of damages that could be won. In the abstract, when they were faced with the abstract question, they had ruled that it wasn't a violation of fundamental constitutional rights, okay, uh, the equal protection. But when we, we turned it around and came up arguing that this was a simple assertion on the part of states of their right to have tort claim recovery for their own citizens against a private facility, and we had 16 states join with us on that. What we did is we got the state's rights people on the Supreme Court to go for us. Because we were basically arguing a state's rights argument over and against the federal government. And so that's, that's how we ended up getting, as the most important person we got on by that argument, was William Rehnquist, of all people. That so that, I mean, it, we're down in history that William Rehnquist is the one who was persuaded by our states' rights argument in this particular case, and is the one that is responsible for shutting down the construction of nuclear power plants in the United States. So that's, that's, what, that's how we won that particular uh, appeal. And then what happened is the Supreme Court, of course, said, look, uh, because, of, because you have not, uh, what they simply said, they said, we've reversed the major ruling of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, saying that punitive damages are now authorized. And they sent the case back down to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, telling them to remand the case back to the district court uh, for a, a confirmation of this. Now this becomes very important at this point because because we had not appealed the workman's compensation ruling by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals that ruled that the $500,000 personal injury to her person uh, claim could not be made at common law, that it was only under the Workman's Compensation Act could she be uh, compensated for that. The, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, when they got the case sent back down to them by the Supreme Court, still smarting under that rebuke from the Supreme Court, and still adamantly reactionary. They, what they said is, okay, look, then our, our argument that the $500,000 physical injury claim has to be set aside, and it's just handled administratively by the Workman's Compensation Act, that we can no longer tell how much of the $10 million punitive damage award was awarded by the jury because of her physical injury and how much was awarded because of the damage to her property. And so what we're going to do is we're going to send the case back down to the district court and allow a, 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 a retrial, uh, not on the liability of Kermagee, which has been established, but on the amount of the punitive damages that they believe ought to be imposed because of the conduct of Kerr McGee that resulted in the release of plutonium from the facility that contaminated her home. And uh, when, when that came back down to us, uh, what, we, what we did, because we had been basically vindicated on this major point in front of the Supreme Court, uh, we put in an immediate motion to amend our demand for punitive damages to $70 million. And Judge Tice approved that. And so we were going to have the opportunity now to go back in front of a jury who was going to be instructed by Judge Tice that, look, there has already been a finding of liability against the Kermagee Corporation here. And what we're going to do is we're going to let Jerry Spence and Arthur Angel and Mr. Icard and Mr. Sheehan put on all of the evidence that they have as to the reckless nature of the operation of this facility and to put in clear evidence as to how it was that Silkwood was contaminated. Because that was left too iffy up at the Tenth Circuit. And there were these big arguments about how, well, you couldn't really tell for certain how she was contaminated, who has the burden of proof and proving that, etc. But now that we're back in front of the, the case, we're going to have, because the way in which she was contaminated, 
is the same way that the house was contaminated. And so we didn't have to argue about having to reinstate the physical injury damages. All we had to do is to say, look, if we can show you how reckless and willful the Kermagee Corporation was in causing that plutonium to be placed in her home, what type of punitive damages do you think ought to be imposed against them? And so we, we were just like, you know, uh, being thrown into the, oh, don't throw us into that bramble bush, you know. <laughs> and so that, uh, so we were, we were, uh, we were hot to trot. I mean, we were ready to go. And we came back down, filed the motion to amend to $70 million. Judge Tice approved it. And we were just you know, kind of rubbing our hands like this, getting ready to do this. And uh, then this peculiar thing happened, that, uh, that Bill Silkwood, uh, the father of Karen Silkwood, discovered that he had cancer. And that uh, he asked us to uh, accept a settlement. We didn't ask me, because I wouldn't have accepted it. But he asked Gerald Spence. He asked Jerry Spence if Jerry Spence would, uh, would meet with the Kermagee attorneys and, uh, and tell them that uh, we were open to a settlement. Uh, at which point the Kermagee Corporation basically jumped right out of their shoes and said, uh, yes, we would be happy to settle this. And so the, they, they ended up uh, giving a couple million dollars to the kids. Uh, they gave a couple million dollars to, uh, to Jerry Spence. And Jerry Spence, uh, much to his credit, uh, turned around and contributed half of that to our institute to repay some of the still outstanding loans and uh, bills that we had for paying the actual out-of-pocket costs for the entire litigation. So they ended up paying a portion of the actual costs of, our, of the litigation, uh, gave the kids a, a couple million dollar trust fund, uh, and, uh, and gave Jerry a million dollar uh, uh, fee. So, it, but, but very importantly, the case still stands for the proposition that that punitive damages can be imposed upon a private nuclear facility for any type of escape of radiation from their plant, whether it is below or above the amounts that are authorized by the Atomic Energy Commission. And so what's, the, the question was asked the other day is, well, what, what's, why is it then that all of a sudden the, uh, the Obama administration has now gone ahead and licensed these two new facilities down in down in uh, Georgia. How, why, what did they do? Well, what happened here is that the, the, uh, the Obama administration, because Obama uh, uh, favors private nuclear power as an alternative uh, energy to source to petroleum, uh, and as you recall the discussion that I had with him uh, out in Iowa, you know, when, uh, when I confronted him on this particular issue about, you know, how could he, well, I'll, I'll reiterate it for you if you don't remember. How many of you remember that conversation? So that, good, I don't have to redo that. Okay, good. But, but so so he, he basically favors it. And so what he did is he uh, and his administration uh, authorized an amendment of the uh, Price-Anderson Act uh, in which they, they have uh, actually now upped the amount of, uh, of insurance that will be provided, but not through the private insurance companies. I mean, because, of course, Obama doesn't want to alienate the private insurance companies. He's already given them like $400 billion in the alternative health system he's got now. And so what he did, however, is he said, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up a pool in which all 103 of the private nuclear facilities in the country are going to put an amount of money into a pool you don't have to actually put it there, but you have to pledge it if necessary. And we're going to put it into a pool that uh, will amount to $12.5 billion in total. And that, uh, that that money will be put up to cover the damages if they are, if they are found to lie against a particular uh, private nuclear corporation due to the release of plutonium. And uh, or radiation from their facilities, and over and above that, the United States government will agree to either 
in, in, I've got to find my actual language because it's kind of strange the way they went ahead and, and did this thing. But what, what they did is they, is they said that, anyway, what they, what they would do is they would provide the $12.5 billion from the insurance pool, self-insurance pool from the, from the nuclear facilities, and that if, in fact, there is a damage award awarded higher than that, the United States government, now through the amendment, the 2011 amendment of the Price-Anderson Act, will agree to, to imburse the, the uh, private corporation for any amount of damages over and above that, which will fall on the American taxpayer. So, so that they, uh, they basically put one over uh, on the American people. I mean, they, they had gotten away with it first back in 1954 to the tune of $500 million. Uh, and now they've gotten away with it, uh, even though they've gotten a self-insurance pool for $12.5 billion. But anything over and above that, the taxpayer is going to be on the hook for that. Now, the, that was, this was a, a, a statute that was actually originally proposed by the George W. Bush administration. They were planning to, to build 200 new private nuclear power plants. Uh, but given the fact that you know, he basically got caught with a storm you know, for invading the Middle East and lying to everybody and uh, just escaped being impeached, basically, he didn't, uh, W. didn't have the, the political capital to actually get that thing passed. And so like many other instances, just like with NAFTA, you know, Bill Clinton, a Democrat, was able to come in and get NAFTA passed, whereas a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the Republican presidents would never have been able to get that done because all the unions would have mobilized against them. But when you get a Democrat in the White House and they come in and they start uh, addressing some of the, the desires of the Republican constituency, uh, they can get away with it. And so Obama has done that. Obama has snuck through the 2011 amendment of the Price-Anderson Act, raising the insurance, self-insurance pool to 12.5 billion, and has put the American taxpayers on the hook for any private damages over and above that for any particular nuclear facility. Now, they anticipate in Japan the liability for the nuclear facility in Japan, the Fukuyama uh, uh, facility, is going to run into the trillions of dollars, and so the you know a, a, a major take for example Indian Point. Indian Point is a major private nuclear facility just outside of New York City. If that if that facility were to melt down and have a massive release of radiation, it would contaminate all of New York City and that whole area. Just try to try to imagine what the, the money damages would be uh, for, for a, a catastrophic event of that nature. And yet, n nothing over and above the pool that's been put together by the private nuclear industry, uh, of those 103 facilities have put together $12.5 billion. You can divide that up, you know, that, uh, what is it, like $1.2 billion uh, dollars for uh, uh, each of those, is that right? No, 120 million. 120 million. Okay, 120 million dollars. You know, so each one of them will cough up 120 million bucks, and that's the limitation. And and, and yet there's a there's a uh, the decision in the in the electric uh, Pacific Gas and Electric of asserting that it's not unconstitutional for them to set a cap on legal liability, but because of the Silkwood case having authorized punitive damages, that's been affirmed. And so that the amount of damages could go way over that. They've, we've won the case saying the actual compens compensatory damages for actual damages can in fact be assessed, no matter what the rules and regulations are, and in fact punitive damages can be assessed. But the, what has happened now is that the federal government has come in not to limit the liability They've agreed not to have any cap on the liability, but they, in fact, are going to have the taxpayers on the hook for it. So that's, that's where we are right now. And I, I believe that the vast majority of people in the country are not aware of that. And the vast majority of people in the country don't, aren't particularly excited about having nuclear power at all. 
especially not near them. And so that we, we've got a situation here where, where it's going to be extremely important that people mobilize to stop the construction of these power plants, that the administration is going to be adopting the W. Bush administration policy of potentially building as, much as, as many as 200 new private nuclear facilities. And with one of the major dangers over and above the simple catastrophic failure of one of these facilities and an actual meltdown of the nature that we had at Three Mile Island. But when you, when you, you co-join that with the potential uh, natural disasters that can take place, when you, when you have the, the kind of catastrophic tornadoes that you have, a hundred tornadoes, for example, you know, touching down in, state, in the state of Alabama in one night, you know, or the massive flooding that you had in New Orleans if there was a nuclear facility there. And here you've got nuclear facilities at San Onofre and in Diablo Canyon that are sitting right on the ocean front, right there, right right along a massive uh, earthquake fall of the San Andreas Fault here in California. You know, and so the, 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 it's, it's virtually inevitable that there is going to be one of these major catastrophic uh, failures of one of those, one of those uh, facilities. And if you add to the 100 that are here, uh, an additional 200 of them, and, and they, they build these things willy-nilly. You know, they build them according to the political realities, not according to the, the, the safest place for them to be. They build them in the congressional districts of the most powerful congressmen. So you get Senator Robert S. Kerr building the facility right in his home district, even though it's in Tornado Alley. And so you're going to get a repeat of that kind of thing along the sea coasts, and we're looking at massive sea level rise. I mean, there, there's nobody, there's nobody with a political IQ above room temperature that, that doesn't realize that they're not doing anything to stop global warming. You know, that when, when in fact the International Panel on Climate Change from the United Nations says that it's absolutely essential by the year 2012 to reduce the, the annual output of carbon emissions by 70 by 70 percent over the 1990 limits we're already at 2012 it's perfectly clear we're not going to be reducing them by that and you get people even like al gore coming in and going down to the to the climate change conventions and saying how about seven percent you know like just having the decimal point in the wrong place <laughs> you know like how about a seven percent reduction by 2040 not a 70 percent reduction by 2012, but a 7% reduction by 2040. It's perfectly evident that the, the major sea rise that has been predicted by the International Panel on Climate Change is going to take place. There are full-scale courses being taught at major universities now about the massive consequences that are to be anticipated by the global rise of sea levels. You know, that there's going to be literally hundreds of millions of square miles on the planet inundated by the rise in sea levels. And yet you're going to see them trying to build private nuclear facilities along those lines, where those places are. And if one of these nuclear facilities goes underwater, you know, the contamination that could be released into the water around the world just, just flows into the, into the world. That's the, that's the problem with one of these things. And the, the, the question as to whether or not it would cause an explosion it's one of the major issues that they were dealing with in Fukuyama, is you know, with, with the rise of that water into the facility, you know, what was going to happen? Was it going to cause it to explode? Was it going to cause it to, to stop functioning? What was, it going to, what was it going to do? And the fact of the matter is, they have not, in fact, calibrated those types of events into the protection systems that are designed for these facilities. You know? So that this, is, this is the situation that we're in here. But, the Silkwood case has provided us with the kind of tools that has, has required the federal government to make the mistake of attempting to get away with basically secretly imposing upon the American taxpayers the legal liability for a catastrophic failure of one of these facilities. And so that we have every right to rise up and, and say, that, look, at, we've now found out about what you've done that you have put this burden, this financial burden, on us, and we're not going to stand for it. 
and that we are going to mobilize and revoke the amendment, the 2011 amendment to the Price-Anderson Act, and not not take this burden on. So, so anyway, that's that's the uh, that's the Silkwood case. Uh, that's what the appellate process was, and, and I'll just give you a, a, a quickie on, on Three Mile Island uh, that you need to, to, to as soon as as soon as we won. The, the decision in, in, the, in the, the Karen Sokol case uh, back in June of 1979, I told you the very final witness that Kerr McGee was putting on in rebuttal, uh, he was on the stand when we got word that the Three Mile Island facility was melting down. And so when we won the, when we won the verdict uh, at, at Kerr McGee, and it went out all across the whole country, the people from Three Mile Island uh, contacted their local church uh, it was an Episcopal church, and uh, asked uh, if they could possibly get in touch with the people that just won the Silkwood case, and if we could, if they could get us to come in there to help them. And so we basically went right straight from the from the celebration out in the, in the press conferences out in front of the out in front of the courthouse. We went to the airport and got on a plane and flew to Pennsylvania, and we arrived in Pennsylvania. We went to the local high school a gymnasium. <clears throat> where I mean, it's, it's just like a, a fabulous movie. Uh, you know, you get the, the people from the from the local PTA that are there. The the captain of the of the volunteer fire department was there. You know, the uh, the, the dog catcher, the sheriff was there. All the, the citizens were there, kind of up in arms about what it is that was going on there, and uh, and they didn't know what was going on. We we filed a, a motion immediately to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and learned that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which had now replaced the Atomic Energy Commission, because the Atomic Energy, you love this, <coughs> the Atomic Energy Commission had been charged back in 1954 with both promoting the development, the, the expanded development of private nuclear power, as well as regulating it. And so that given the fact that in every single instance it was made completely obvious that they were compromising all of the enforcement standards on behalf of promoting it, uh, that the Congress went to the radical step of actually dividing it in two. Same staff, same people, same offices. <laughs> but one of them was called the Atomic Energy Commission, and the other was the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so what we, what we learned when we filed this first motion, we found out that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had already issued a license authorizing the Three Mile Island nuclear facility to pump all the radioactive water and effluents from that facility into the Susquehanna River. That there had been no, no major analysis of what had happened. Uh, the, the company claimed that there had been no breach of any kind of the core, and that therefore, the, as best as they could tell, there were no, no radioactive nucleides that had been released from the core <coughs> into the coolant water, uh, but they had no verification of that. So we brought on a, an action in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which we're required to do because it's the administrative agency that regulates these facilities. We had to bring the action in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to exhaust our administrative remedies before we would have standing to bring an action in the federal district court. So we brought on the action in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and challenged their issuance of this license. And they just, you know, fought back vigorously and uh, refused to enter an order saying that they were required to withdraw their license. And uh, we told them that we were then getting ready to go to the federal district court now that we had exhausted our administrative remedies and we were going to seek an injunction uh, commanding them to withdraw their license. At which point they voluntarily withdrew that license. And. Uh, and so, so you asked the question, did we succeed? You know, we didn't win the, the uh, argument to compel them to re remove it, but they did so voluntarily under the threat of us going to the federal district court. And when they did, we moved in front of them to demand that there was a full inspection of the facility, and lo and behold, there had in fact been a partial meltdown of the core. And uh, radioactive nuclei had in fact been released into the coolant water. And if that water had been pumped into the Susquehanna River, the best estimates are that there would have been 50,000 cases of cancer that would have been generated in the population downstream in a plume from that release. 
Uh, and so, and the fact is that if we hadn't done the Karen Sopwood case, that we probably would never have been asked to be the ones to go up and, and take that kind of aggressive action on behalf of those folks. And in fact, they would have gotten away with pumping the water out. And they would have said, look, there was never any kind of contamination, there was never any kind of a serious breach of the, of the court, because they had already said that publicly. And then there, there would have been no major Three Mile Island uh, scandal. So that the combination, the one-two punch, uh, well, actually the one-two-three punch, the one-two the, the, the one punch was the Karen Sopwood case authorizing punitive damages, followed immediately by the stopping of the pumping of the water out and then discovering that in fact there had been major meltdown of the uh, facility. And then the third punch, of course, was the Karen Silkwood movie that uh, came out uh, very quickly uh, by Mike Nichols, uh, starring you know, Merle Streep and uh, Cher and everyone, and was nominated for five Academy Awards, and, uh, and it was seen all around the world. Uh, and so that, that, that type of one, two, three punch is what actually has stopped the construction of private nuclear facilities in the country uh, up until February. And so now we're back in front of them having to mobilize. And uh, if we can, in fact, get the uh, 2011 amendment of the Price-Anderson Act uh, revoked, then, in fact, they will be back into complete exposure. Uh, so, that, so that's where we, that's where we are. Uh, so and, and that gives us time for questions. Even though, now, this is, this is a lot of technical stuff. And it's not, you don't have to remember all of this. It's just that uh, it, I, want, I wanted you to see the kind of complexity uh, that is involved. Uh, you, you try to resolve as much of this as you can at a trial. You try to get uh, factual findings made by a jury. Uh, and, and usually, usually a, a circuit court of appeals finds it impossible to get around those kind of factual findings. You will see that the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals did in this case. They actually waded right down in, into the facts and, and set aside the stipulation. We had a stipulation that in fact Karen Soka had been contaminated at her home and she had been contaminated by lot number 29 which was not in the facility at all. We had direct stipulations to that. And the Federal, the federal Circuit Court of Appeals just backed right up and said, well oh, look, uh, from our point of view, uh, the only logical, or the most logical, didn't say the only logical, the most, lo the more logical conclusion is that this happened as a spill from the kit, okay? Because they were just desperately trying to figure out something that fell under the Workman's Compensation Act. The, the problem is, is that the kit had no contamination on the outside of it at all. And if there had been a spill of the, of the kit, there would have been contamination. All there was is Karen was trying to, trying to, you know, hysterically figure out what could conceivably have happened to her. And she had said, maybe, maybe I spilled some from that. And, and Kerr McGee seized upon that and said she did it on purpose. But the jury, as you'll recall, the very first question they answered is that Karen Silver did not do this on purpose. And they explicitly found that to be true. And their second one was that they found that Karen Silkwood had, in fact, been contaminated due to an escape of, of radioactive materials from the facility to her apartment. And that that had been the proximate causation of her injuries. And, of the, and yet the, the, court, the Court of Appeals waded right on into it and unpacked the entire thing and said that they think that the more, the more logical conclusion is that it was in fact a spill from the contamination kit and that therefore it would be covered by workman's compensation. And they completely ignored a provision in Judge, King, in Judge Tice's opinion. Judge Tice points out that in the, in, in the instruction discussion that we were having in chambers, we specifically said, oh, if they, if they, want, to, if they want to maintain that Karen Sopwood did this on purpose to herself, how about we get a question put to the jury, do you think that one of the Kerr McGee officials did this to her on purpose? Or do you believe that in fact uh, it was an accidental spill from the contamination kit? And Kerr McGee totally objected to either one of those instructions. And yet the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals went right ahead and on their own, sui sponte, uh, the two judges, at least, Logan and McKay, said, oh, uh, we think that the more likely thing is that it came from this contamination from the kid. You know, complete defiance of a stipulation in the trial. 
so that you, you, need to, you, you need to be on guard in your trials to close every single door. And when, they're, when, they're, when they start saying to you, the judge starts saying to you, no, 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 you don't, you don't, really, you don't really need to do that. You say, excuse me, uh, thank you for the courtesy, but uh, uh, I'm going to do it anyhow. I want this thing locked down. I want it made absolutely clear that this stipula what this stipulation is about. More pointedly, I don't even care about the stipulation. I'm perfectly happy to prove to you exactly how the condemnation took place. And you're going to have to you know, suffer the ire of the judge. And you need to be careful about that because once you generate the ire of the judge, they can hurt you badly. You know, with different rulings that they make that are within their discretion and the kind of tone they take with the jury and everything else. But you, uh, but, uh, but you don't, don't, don't lie down uh, when, you, when you know that something is of critical importance to your case. Okay? So, if, so let's, uh, let's have a discussion about it. There's a lot of stuff here. Uh, my, my question was about a, a nuclear meltdown, uh, and you said that the, now the United States is like strictly liable for any cost above, like you know, some very low threshold. Twelve point five billion. Twelve point five billion, and that cost is very high. It seems to me that we would not actually be willing to pay that, and that at some point, rather than the taxpayers being like the victims, would be liable. Uh, do you believe that in the case of nuclear meltdown, that everybody would receive compensation for the damages, or do you think they would just be left to? Well, it's a, no, no. I think everybody. I think everybody would be. Uh, what would happen? What would happen? Given the fact that the judges are all appointed by the Republican or Democratic Party, is what they would do is they would insist upon a settlement. Uh, for example, the Cobell case. We just, we just had an example of it. The uh, the uh, Elizabeth Cobell, who was the treasurer for the Blackfoot tribe of the Lakota up in Montana, she was elected to be the treasurer of the tribal council, and she was going through the books and she says, "Oh, look here." Uh, it turns out that in 1879, under the Dawes Act, the United States Department of Interior uh, established a trust responsibility over our tribal trust lands here on our reservation. And they've been renting them out to white ranchers and to miners and to, to uh, farmers and to everything else. And they've been collecting money for this and they were supposed to pay us for this, but I don't see any record of them having paid us. And so she contacted the Department of Interior and asked for an accounting. And they said, oh, uh, we never kept any kept track of that. And they said, well, we don't have any record of you having paid us anything. And they said, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's right. And so she said, well, pay us. And they said, pay you what? He said, pay us what you collected. They said, well, we don't know what we collected. We said, well, that's no excuse. You can't not pay us anything because you couldn't figure out what it is. And they said, well, that's what our position is. And so they ended up suing. The, 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 the Blackfoot tribe sued the Department of Interior to, to get them to give an accounting. And a, and a Republican judge uh, on the, in the Federal District Court in, in Washington, D.C. went through the thing over and over and over and over again. He discovered that the, that the Department of Interior had, had consciously refused to keep these records and consciously refused to pay the people for it despite the trust responsibility they had. And so he issued an order ordering them to do an accounting. And they said, well, wait a second, that would be astronomical. They said the accounting itself would cost $10 billion to do. And so the judge said, well, fine, go ahead and do it. And they said, we're not going to do it. $10 billion, we're not going to do that. And so he held them in contempt. He, had, he held the head of the Department of Interior in contempt and was going to put her in prison for it. And so they, they started having an hysterical attack. And then so the judge said, and not only that, but the way you've been acting, if you did this to the Blackfoot tribe up in Montana, I assume you did it to every other one of the other tribes in the country, all 600 of them. And so I'm going to allow this to be a class action. So they filed a class action. They committed to a class action and they, 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 so that they had to do an accounting for every single one of the 600 tribes of their, of their property. And then they got to the point saying, look, at this is astronomical. The amount is so astronomical that how, how are we supposed to pay that? And the judge said, well, you should have thought about that, you know, because you got all the money. It isn't as though you didn't get the money from the, from the leases to the mining companies and oil companies and, and ranchers and all that. So you've, you've had the money, so you've got to pay it. And so they went to the administration and had the Justice Department file a motion to take him off the case for being biased against the government. Huh. Yeah. A Republican federal judge biased against the government. Right? And so they removed it. And they put this judge on, this other judge, 
<laughs> and uh, and the judge says, "Oh well, look, uh, we're going we're going to have a settlement here. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, uh, you figure out. Uh, you have the, the plaintiff's lawyers figure out what the what the absolute minimum amount is. The absolute minimum amount is that you estimate that the that your client is is due, and we'll give them one percent of that." <laughs> And that's what he did. And he entered the order that there was to be a settlement for 1% of the lowest possible estimate of what was owed to them. And that's what stands as the Cobell settlement right now. Okay? And so, so if, if you want to ask what would likely happen, is that that's what would likely happen. Now, it's a lot easier to screw over Native American people than it is a lot of white middle class people that might live in the area that got their houses and stuff destroyed. So you probably find some, some uh, probably two percent. They might, be, you know, depending entirely upon the political pressure that was applied to them. Which brings us back to the same issue here: is that is that the rules of law and objective neutral principles function only to a very limited degree. Now, in ninety-five percent of all the cases that you would do, they will hold. But when you get out around the, the perimeters, when you get out to the borderlines of the law here, and you start to have extraordinary circumstances, what happens is the political realities start to manifest themselves. And so long as the, the state and federal judges are basically appointed by political parties, and even those that are elected are nominated by the political parties, that's how they get onto the ballot. You know, and as long as as long as we have a judicial system that is totally politicized, then we have the power in a democracy to fight back politically by organizing and mobilizing. But what you can't do is you can't sit passively by and expect them to do it just because they're supposed to, or just because they promised to, or just because they're legally obligated to. That's not how it happens. You have to make them do it. But it's important to remember that in this country, still, we have the capacity to make these political people do things that we want them to do. But it just takes a lot more work than most people are willing to do. Okay? So that so that you have to you have to in preparation for what's getting ready to happen, that we started talking about at the very beginning of the course, and we'll return to again. Uh, in light of what's getting ready to happen with the major rise in sea levels, the, uh, the attempt to build 200 new private nuclear power facilities right in a lot of the areas where the water is going to be rising, in earthquake zones, in tornado zones, and stuff like that, that it's going to behoove us to have to become much, much more active. Uh, and and, and you, can, you can say to yourself, well, uh, I prefer not to have to be active because it's uncomfortable. I've got other things to do. You know, I you know I got a lot of schoolwork to do. I got you know stuff to do playing. I've got my family stuff I need to pay attention to. You know, but the fact is, is that you're going to have to realize that you know in when when 2030 comes along, and you're sitting there with a horrendous state of conditions obtaining in the country, you won't be able to say that nobody told you so, and you won't be able to say that oh all that time that I for went. You know, doing hard work to try to change things politically, you know, it is approximately caused the situation that now obtains, and that's what you have to look forward to. So that you, know, you just have to do the work. What, what do you kind of like? What do you recommend that we do, like as individuals? It's just kind of like the system is already is already kind of like in place. Kind of like the political system is already in place, mm -hmm. and it's no like individual can kind of change the structure. So it's very hard to. It's collect collective action. That's why you you you've got your finger right on it. It's a the, but what what you should do, what what I would recommend that you do is that you go to law school, that because because the, then you know what the tools are that they have designed to enable them to exercise this kind of power, and you also learn how to use those tools to the extent to which they can be useful in pushing them back, even within the set of their own rules. 
And, and you can see in this particular case, for example, we were successful in stopping the construction of nuclear power plants in the country, and they'd invested hundreds of billions of dollars in that technology. Hundreds of billions of dollars. And all of that power that they that they had used to coerce the Congress and to buy off the Congress and stuff was stopped. You know? And we were able to make arguments that when you thought about it carefully enough, were able to convince even Rehnquist. You see? And so the the, the, your, the number one thing you need to do is you need to is you is you should go to law school. Because then you know what the rules are, you know how the system works, you know what the different agencies are that you can that you can get at, and you can also learn how what lobbying is all about. Because you because a lawyer doesn't just do trials, and doesn't just do appellate work. Uh, a lawyer learns how to lobby. They learn how to be congressional representatives. They learn how to be state representatives. You learn how the mechanisms of government really function. You know, and the the the, the reality is is that you know you're going to have to do something. Uh, anyhow, you know, I mean, to even earn a living. So, you know, you can do this. You can you can spend time, you know, doing law stuff and doing public interest law and other percentage of your time earning money doing regular law stuff. Uh, but you, you become more and more empowered. And people can come to you and say, you know, can I get some free legal advice? <laughs> you know, and you can help them by, by doing that. And then collectively, you can work together. You can form groups. You know, you can form groups of like public interest law firms and, and, and go after these people, you know, and, and make no mistake about who these people are. You know, because you can see them. They're not hiding out, mostly. The interest of equal time, uh, what about the Sarah Nelson track? In the world? Well, that, that of course, is a, is a major thing that Sarah was very clear about. The organizing. You need to be a, a, a community organizer, a grassroots organizer, public education activities. You can become a journalist, you know, investigative journalists who, who write. Now, now you have the, the internet, I mean, so that you can, you can do investigations and you can write blogs and get the information out all across the country. I mean, we used to have to sit and lick stamps. You know, we used to, have, you know, one, one at a time, put them in the mail, you know, like that, to send out to people all over the country. Now all you have to do is you know you type it up and send it to a thousand people, you know. So that that, that organizing, public education, uh, all of those kind of activities. But these are what are called public interest activities, you know, and public interest skills that you can have. And so these are the kind of things that you ought to look to because you're now many of you at least are getting to that point now where you're trying to figure out which kind of graduate school you're going to go to, you know. And of course that that's really important. I mean. It's important to go to graduate school, whether it's law school or journalism school or some other professional school. But because you know, basically, with just with just a college education, even with as good a college education as you get here, you know, where you get to have courses like this, isn't going to isn't going to put you in the mix much. You know, you you will not get into the positions where you can have the the kind of influence that you could have. Uh, if you go to graduate school, and if you go to law school, or if you become a professional journalist, or something like that, there are, there are certain professions that enable you to to have an effect. Some of them are ones you wouldn't think much of. Art, for example, you know, artists and writers. You, you know, all during the '60s and '70s, you know, some of the some of the singers and, and artists were most influential. They people who did movies. You know, Oliver Stone did Platoon, you know, major blow to the to the, the Vietnam War. You know, so you can do motion pictures, you can do documentaries, you know, you can sing songs, uh, you can organize marches. You know, there's 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 a there's a set of there's a set of books. I think his name is Gene Sharp. His name is Gene Sharp. Uh, there's a three volume set, but you should you can get it on the, you can get it on the, every, everybody here should get a set of that. You know, you, you go on to Amazon. Dot com, and you can get them used, you know, maybe three ninety five a piece, you know, plus fifty dollars for shipping. You know? <laughs> but, but you get you can get you can get there's a three volume set. It's called uh, uh, what, me methods of nonviolence. Methods of nonviolence, and it's a uh, Gene Sharp. Uh, it's three volumes. You ought to get them, and you ought to have them on your shelf all the time. You know, because what they do is they, it reviews for you, and I don't know if there's an update on it, but it reviews for you 
all the different kinds of tactics that have been undertaken by people down through time against tyrannical government and power. You know, er everything from organizing, petition drives, etc., to basically, you know, burning down bridges uh, to keep them from sending tanks across to kill a whole town full of innocent people. You know? Oh, I just want to be kicking this a little bit. I, I'm not a lawyer, and I've been involved mostly in entrepreneurial activities for for profits, but I've done some nonprofits, and I was really surprised that when I got into it and studying nonprofits and nonprofit law, how far, how much you can have an influence if you get yourself a good cause, you get connected to people, even not as an attorney. You can go out there and organize and form some great nonprofits, I mean, Ralph Nader made a career out of it doing this sort of thing. That's right. And you can go out there and do some good at being creative, and yeah. being smart and about it. So yeah. Just and so, so, so you need to organize. You need to organize and educate and mobilize and litigate and appeal and, uh, and run for office, you know, draft legislation. Uh, you know, these are these are things that you just need to do. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to reach out to the public citizen in each of you. You know, that every one of us has a public citizen inside of us there. Some of us, you know, spend most of our time exercising that particular aspect of our person. Uh, and others spend less time. But all of us have a public person inside of us. And so that's what I'm strongly recommending that you do. Thank you.